In February, I was really lucky to be able to go to UNIS, which is a university on Svalbard, right up in the Arctic. And I was there as part of my PhD course. I went to learn all about glaciology. And whilst I was there, I took the camera up and I tried to film a little bit about what you do as part of the course there. And this is what we came back with. Just 700 miles from the North Pole is the remote archipelago of Svalbard. Mainland Norway lies to the south, the Russian Arctic lies to the east, Greenland to the west, and north of Svalbard is the ever-shifting pack ice and the North Pole. Winters in Svalbard are unforgiving. Temperatures can get below minus 35 degrees centigrade and the sun doesn't rise above the horizon during the three months. Arctic storms regularly scour the islands, bringing ferocious winds and snow. Svalbard was formally discovered in the 16th century by the Dutch navigator Willem Berends. It is only in the recent past that permanent settlements were established. However, at the beginning of the 20th century, with the development of the mining industry, it was important to establish the ownership of the land and mineral deposits. Under the Spitsbergen Treaty, Svalbard became part of Norway, but it also allowed other signing nations to have equal rights in residence, property and research. In fact, people from many nations live in Svalbard today. The main settlement is the town of Longyearbyen, the most northerly town in the world. Originally built as a coal mining town by American mine owners Longyear and Ayer. The pylons for the cable transport system, which was used to carry the coal from the mountain mines down to the dock, are still dotted around the town. The coal mining industry was the main employer until the 1990s when many of the coal mines closed. Two mines are still run by the Norwegians and it is an important employer, but today tourism is the backbone of the economy. Longyearbyen feels like a modern cosmopolitan Scandinavian town. You have to look hard to find clues that you are actually in the high Arctic. When we arrived in early February, there were just a few hours of light every day. The islands are just coming out of the polar night and the Norwegians call this time the blue time because the light has got this really surreal blue quality to it and it's dark already by two or three o'clock in the afternoon. The bright lights of Longyearbyen light up the Arctic sky. When I left a month later, it was almost 24 hours of daylight, which in the Arctic makes for a dramatic February. Longyearbyen is also home to UNIS, the world's most northerly university. Every year in February, Professor Doug Ben runs an intensive glaciology course. The course covers all aspects of glaciology, and the students also learn important field safety skills. We covered an awful lot over the four weeks, and everything that we learned in the classroom was reinforced by trips to glaciers on snowmobiles. We would spend the week learning about some pretty complex physics of glaciers and then we'd go into the field and see the features that illustrated everything we'd learned perfectly. Svalbard is a mountainous and treeless landscape with snow cover from early autumn to late spring. In fact, 60% of Svalbard is covered in ice. There are larger ice caps and smaller independent glaciers. Going anywhere in Svalbard is a serious undertaking. It is so cold that exposed skin can get frostbitten after just a few minutes. You have to be constantly vigilant for danger. Svalbard is home to more polar bears than people, 
so rifles are always carried for protection against these predators. The Svalbard archipelago is also home to a cluster of surging glaciers, which periodically accelerate and surge forwards. The first glacier we visited was the beautiful Tuna Brain in Templefjord. We travelled across the frozen fjord and were able to access the carving front of the glacier. Tuna Brain has recently surged. It accelerated dramatically and surged forwards into the fjord. Surging occurs periodically over timescales of tens to hundreds of years. During the quiet phase, or quiescent phase, the glacier really only moves very slowly, just perhaps a few centimetres a year. And during this time, ice and snow slowly build up in the reservoir zone of the glacier. Eventually, a threshold is crossed and a surge is triggered. Ice suddenly begins to flow much faster and the surge will propagate downstream. In many cases, the glacier will advance hundreds or even thousands of metres forwards. At the front of Tunabrine, the ice is full of sediment from the bed of the glacier. It is this sediment that acts like sandpaper on the landscape as the glacier flows, carving deep U-shaped valleys and fjords. It was really interesting to see the features within the glacier that are left over from the surge. The deformation that the ice has undergone is really, really clear. You don't often get to see these features in glacial ice. Folding and faulting is normally only visible in rock structures. Here at Tunabrain is one of the best places in the world that you can see these deformation structures caused by surging. It's a really intense course, but during the weekends there are a few opportunities to get out into the mountains of Svalbard and explore the island a bit. The university owns a few remote cabins, which can be used by students. Getting there required mastering a few new skills for some of the students. The route to the hut involved climbing over a mountain plateau. The bitter cold and the steep gully made the going tough. At the head of the gully, the students emerged into a bleak world of wind and snow. Crossing the plateau took several hours of hard slog. Skiers were rewarded with a few downhill stretches. After a long and cold trek through the barren landscape, the hut finally came into sight. It was a strenuous day to get there, and hot food always tastes good after a long day out in the cold. The following day, the route for another long trek was carefully planned. 
Another week and another field trip. This week we've been learning all about glacier hydrology, which is the role of water in a glacier through melting and through all sorts of other processes. We managed to get out to a glacier where there's a glacier cave which was formed by the summer meltwater and we actually had a chance to get right inside this cave and have a look around. At this time of the year, temperatures are so low that everything is frozen solid and the glacier is stable. It was relatively safe to explore inside. However, once the temperatures rise, the caves fill with meltwater and often collapse. Glaciers cover most of the landscape. Textbook glacial landforms such as moraines are visible all over the archipelago. Moraine ridges are a great place to get an overview of glaciers. Moraines are basically just piles of glacial sediment which have been bulldozed by the glacier into prominent ridges. There are many different types of moraine, but probably the most obvious and the most common are terminal moraines. These are formed at the front of the glacier as sediment is pushed forwards during the flow and as it advances, and these form prominent ridges around the front of the glacier. Moraines are really, really useful you can tell, for starters, just from looking at a moraine, how big the glacier has been in the past. So when you start to map these, you can then infer all sorts of other information, perhaps about climate. You can start to think about what sort of temperature and what sort of precipitation you would have needed to form a glacier that big to form these huge moraine ridges. The final field trip took us to Gronfjord Brain, which is a glacier maybe 50 kilometres to the west of Longyearbyen. Here at the glacier, we were able to see some impressive cliffs made of ancient sedimentary rocks which form most of Svalbard. The strata formed as individual layers which were deposited in an ancient sea hundreds of millions of years ago. Since then, these have been thrust up and exposed by glacial erosion. Shortly after arriving, the weather started to turn. High, fast-moving clouds signalled the start of an Arctic snowstorm. The weather came in quickly and the students had to shelter in nearby Barentsburg. Barentsburg was established as a coal mining town in the 1920s. It is smaller and more isolated than Longyearbyen. The town is now Russian, home to Russians and Ukrainian miners. There is even a Russian consulate maintained in the town, the most northerly in the world. The course at Eunice was a really special experience. We all learned an awful lot and we all worked really, really hard. And it was amazing to be taught by some of the best glaciologists in the field. Probably the best bit was just having the chance to live in Svalbard for a month and getting to visit some of these glaciers and get right up close to them and see exactly what's going on. And that really was inspiring. 